As we begin to think about atomic theory, one of the things that I have our students do in class is uh, take a sheet of paper, a really small uh, part of that sheet of paper, and then keep ripping it in half and ripping it in half and ripping it in half. And if you think about it, if you keep ripping it, you can get it to be where it's really small, but then even your fingers can't rip it, right? So maybe you could get some tweezers or something like that and keep ripping it. And so if you think about, you know, what makes up every every everyday objects, it's, uh, you know, we could just think about, okay, yeah, if we just keep ripping and ripping, we'll just get this little, maybe, you know, uh, small little blob that uh, makes up matter, you know, eventually, right? Maybe we can't even see this, the size of it. And so if we understand the history of matter that way, um, you know, in the beginnings of that, we could see why, you know, at the beginning, we had very, very basic understanding. And then through the years, you know, kind of developed the atomic theory. And so 400 BC, uh, the Greek philosopher uh, Dem Democritus, probably butchered that name, proposed that matter is made up of atoms and cannot be divided. So, you know, if you get down to the very, very basic elements, um, didn't even use that word, but, um, you know, that, that we have these very small building blocks. Um, and then really up until the 17th century, his theory remained unproven. You know, um, experimental sciences uh, weren't popular yet in terms of uh, looking at this. And um, Newton believed all matter was ultimately made of the same thing, that, that everything that, that we see on earth, you know, ultimately had the, you know, the same building block there. And um, it wasn't until the 19th century with Dalton, who was a chemist, suggested that atoms were, were different and had different properties. Um, they used, he used chemical reactions proving his ideas and, and showing that, yeah, you know, there's, there's different elements, there's different um, building blocks, you know, that the atoms aren't, aren't all the same thing. Um, and then, you know, uh, continuing with early atomic theory, matter is made of particles and it contains charge and, um, you know, there's electrical properties in matter, but the atom itself is neutral. And so um, J.J. Thompson, 1879, uh, discovered the electron and it, he, his uh, discovery, pro you know, provided a, a new model of the atom. And so... Um, he used the cathode ray tube, and it's really interesting how this works. The, he, there's a picture of this here. Uh, let's use another color here, a picture of it here. You know, and as um, he set this up, he actually was able to get those electrons to fly off one side and go to the other, and was able to measure that electrons have charge, that they have a certain amount of mass, and um, you know, was able to, to say, okay, we have these, uh, these electrons that can go from atom to atom. And so, um, yeah, we, should, you, you, we can shoot those electrons from one side to the other. And, and um, you know, uh, and electrons weren't even known at that time until, uh, until he found this out. And he took the mass of the cathode ray itself and discovered that electrons themselves actually had mass and um, this is very very significant so his model is the plum pudding model and you've probably seen this before electrons floating in a bob of or blob of positively charged material the reason they call it plum pudding is because uh, you know they i guess had pudding and inside the pudding they had plums and so the analogy here is that these electrons are plums inside a positively charged pudding. And, uh, you know, the whole pudding is positively charged. And then you have these little electrons that are like plums that are floating around and, um, you know, can go from one plum to the other, or one pudding to another. And, uh, yeah. And so, and intuitively, that kind of makes sense, right? You know, if you keep splitting that sheet of paper we just talked about, you know, then you eventually get a blob. And so that kind of, you know, intuitively makes sense. We know that's wrong now, but, you know, uh, at the time it definitely made sense. So if you have a chance, um, type in uh, or Google FET, P-H-E-T, and then um, Google Rutherford scattering and play with that simulation. 
and that will prepare you as we begin to talk about the next uh, the next you know part of the development here and so you can see that so go ahead and pause the clip give it give that a try there and then when you're ready you can uh, hit uh, play to continue okay so what that uh, experiment showed was um, and and if you did the simulation um, what you saw there was a nucleus of a gold atom made of positively charged you know or protons which are positively charged and the neutrons and then we had alpha particles that were shot through and alpha particles are a helium nucleus just two protons two neutrons and most of those flew straight through and then some of them got really close to the nucleus and then deflected at great angles and so an alpha particle looks like this uh, two protons two neutrons and um, this helium nucleus going out the gold foil uh, most of them again passed through, which was contrary to what you know J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model would say that you know you wouldn't you wouldn't have that um, happen. Um, and so um, yeah, occasionally these alpha particles would have very large scattering angles. If you look at those um, those alpha particles that get close to the nucleus, they deflect at a great great angle, right? Um, but most of them just pass straight through. And so yeah, this this was kind of baffling. And uh, Rutherford was able to, um, with Geiger and Marsden, um, were able to think through this and uh, came to the conclusion that the atom contains a very small, heavy, positively, positively charged nucleus and or positive nucleus surrounded by negative electrons and that are in, you know, an empty space essentially. And so. Uh, there's an electrostatic attraction to the nucleus and the electrons are you know whizzing around the the nucleus going around and um and we've got that there so um some of those again some of those alpha particles bounce back at, at very very extreme angles um showing that the uh yeah the particles you know essentially almost had a head-on collision um and because of that, were uh, you know prove that the nucleus was extremely extremely small. Okay, so this uh, fact that the the at these alpha particles get so close showed that it that it had to be that the nucleus had to be very very small, and so. In Thompson's model, if you had a large, you know, blob, positively charged blob, like a, you know, the plum pudding model, spread over the entire volume, what would happen is as those as those alpha particles came close, they deflect a little bit, but not a whole lot, because you know, if you look at the center of this, the center of this, remember, um, you know, the uh, uh, Coulomb's Coulomb's law, right? We have um, force is equal to kq1 over our, kq1 q2 over r squared and so there's a force on that alpha particle over this radius but the radius is kind of big if we have this big blob but what actually is happening is that these alpha particles can get much much closer and as they get closer the radius is small and it shows that you know very very large deflection and that proved that the nucleus must be really, really tiny. And so alpha particles are about 8,000 times more massive um, than uh, electrons. And so, does, you know, can it be the interference of electrons that's showing this deflection? And that's, you know, um, yeah, it's not, you know, so it's, it's the... Uh, um, yeah, so the you know that's not having it. That's not what's causing what's going on. Um, this is another picture of it here, where the fact that uh, you know uh, trying to, to to figure out a way that the alpha particle can have a deflection with a gold atom, um, you know if it's if it's all spread out here, if the positive charge is this whole blob, and the alpha particle grazes the atom, you're not going to get much force. And even if it penetrates the atom, it doesn't matter because even if, you know, you're over the small radius here, it's not as much positive charge there. 
just going to pass uh, even pass through. And so, um, again, uh, showing here that even if the alpha particle pe penetrated the atom, it would not produce this long deflection. Uh, you know, the uh, even if the radius is small, you'd only count the charge within that small radius, and so um, you know wouldn't be much uh, much push on that. So Rutherford again determined that the charge of this nucleus must be very concentrated, that the nucleus itself must be very very small. And now, what uh, one of the things that he said, and this was a uh, this was a problem, and he knew this pretty quickly, was he said, well, okay, we know that the nucleus is is positively charged, it's very tiny and the electrons are going in orbit around the nucleus. Well, if it's just going in orbit, what's gonna happen is that electron is gonna get sucked into the nucleus very quickly and the atom's gonna explode. And so Rutherford knew that this was impossible and was almost ready to you know, abandon um, you know, what was happening. And that's when uh, Niels Bohr came along and um, I show in this clip the uh, some of the, the history behind this, where uh, Bohr um, came and yeah really helped kind of uh, think through what this could actually be with the atomic model. So what Bohr theorized and was able to make this connection was between what was what's happening on the atomic level to light, and so. What we have is the fact that as electrons are around the nucleus, they can only be very, very specific places around the nucleus. They can't be in between. And so they're at these fixed places. And what happens is as the, uh, in this case here, if we had, let's say, you know, hydrogen gas, which, you know, we can see here and uh, we have, uh, that gas that's, uh, you know, um, get this uh, mouse ready. Um, the hydrogen gas is excited, right? So we put a voltage on it and we excite it. What happens is that hydrogen gas, those electrons can go to higher energy levels. And then as they go to higher energy levels, those electrons can go down. They naturally want to go down to lower energy levels and then light will shoot out as that uh, happens. And so if we have that light shoot out and we look at a spectrometer, um, you know, something that can spread that light out, we'll see these very specific bands. And what happens is the, the reason we have these very specific bands here is because that corresponds to very specific transitions inside the atom where the electrons go from outer energy levels to lower energy levels. And so, um, at the center, at the nucleus is at the center of the atom. Electrons exist at specific energy levels again. And um, he was able to say, well, yeah, we can't have them just be in simple orbit because they would accelerate into the nucleus and, you know, give out electromagnetic radiation, have a loss of energy, and, you know, we would be, uh, be in trouble there. And so um, what happens is these packets, packets of light, these photons are produced when the energy level changes. And so um, I use this simulation here, and you could probably find one online if you look up like hydrogen atom simulation, um, you know, energy levels, you know, or you can just, you know, look for this link here at astro.unl.edu and, and see where, if an electron goes from out outer energy level like this, uh, and then goes to an energy level closer to the nucleus, it'll shoot a, a specific photon out with a specific amount of energy, very specific wavelength, specific frequency, corresponding to how much energy that drop is.